Good morning. Good Chicles, the Country Church, Marion, Texas. A short drive to worship the Lord in a relaxed atmosphere. Good morning. If you'll take your Bible and open it to the book of Galatians, the second chapter, Galatians chapter 2, the first 10 verses. Beginning in verse 1, Then fourteen years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person, for they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, or Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Only they that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you again for the reminder that salvation is by grace plus nothing else. Lord, I just pray for our worship time. Lord, I pray for Dave and the praise team as they'll lead us. Father, I pray for our pastor as he'll proclaim your word. Lord, it's our prayer that you would draw people to yourself today, and we'll give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Morning. Tell your first name to four or five people around you on this beautiful Sunday morning so they can know who they're worshiping with. One other announcement that I, I didn't make because I really didn't think Ira Ford wanted me to make it, but uh, her and Chuck have been married 52 years, and uh, where are they at? Where are y'all at? Right over here. Okay. The reason I went ahead and made that so y'all would know how to pray for Ira. Okay. <laughs> Most of you already know, if you know Chuck, so <laughs> praise the Lord. This morning, in defense of truth. And years ago, there used to be uh, a radio program on KDRY that was entitled, In Defense of Truth. And it would hold up the truth of God's Word and rebuke false or erroneous teaching. Well, it is a good program, but it was hardly original <laughs> because Paul was a proclaimer and a defender of the gospel of grace so many, many years before. And here we see Paul's journey to Jerusalem and the emphasis on the gospel of grace. Notice the gospel of grace in the first two verses. Paul says, then after 14 years, after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas 
and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. And as I read these verses, I noticed something so simple that I overlooked it. And I was sharing with the pastor's class, which this morning, and we're just now starting again. So if you haven't been, you don't have to be a member to go to the class. You don't have to go to the class to be a member, but it's a good time for an amount of us to just spend this time together. But I shared with them one of the most asinine statements that I hear is somebody says, I've read through the whole Bible. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Uh, you know, every time you open up the Word of God, you see something new and you say, why didn't I see that last time? Yeah, or I can preach it and another guy gets up to preach the same text. And I said, now, why didn't I think of that when, when I was preaching? But I did see something this time new and exciting to me. Here were three men that were headed for Jerusalem. All three of them were saved. All three of them were identified with Christ. There was Paul and Barnabas and Titus. And it's not just who they were, but it's what they represented. Paul was the preaching missionary evangelist. You know, the Bible says in Romans 10, 14, and 15, How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher, a proclaimer of the word? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And what a witness Paul was. But he wasn't in this by himself. It says Barnabas was along. You remember Barnabas? You know, the Bible says about him in the book of Acts that he had land and he sold it and he brought the money and he laid it in an undesignated offering at the apostles' feet. And God used him and blessed him in a very special way. Barnabas was a man that financially supported the spreading of the gospel. And we don't always speak of the Barnabases of the world. But oh, how God's work would suffer if it wasn't for them. So we have the preacher. And we had the one that God used for provision and Titus. And Titus was some of the fruit of their labor. He was a new convert in Christ. And it was something that they had not only led him to Christ, but they had involved him in the gospel. We get real excited, and I'm fixing probably this next week, or really Joni is, she is going to be a great grandmother for the second time. Now, my deal is, I'm married to a great-grandmother. <laughs> I had to get this off my chest. But when a baby is born, a child is born, everybody gets excited, especially the ladies. And they said, was it a boy or a girl? Mm -hmm. Well, how much did he weigh? Mm -hmm. How long was it? You know. But we get real excited that a baby is born. But if somebody said they took the baby and they put it out by the dumpster and in the middle of the heat and the, the baby just died because of exposure, you'd think they need to be horse whipped. Drag them out behind the back and tell God they died of natural causes. You know. But let me tell you something. We do the same thing spiritually. We're excited when somebody accepts the Lord. Praise God. Somebody was saved and we thank the Lord for it. Do we encourage them to get into the study of the word of God? Do we encourage them to see them grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord? 
And then when they falter or when they fall, we say, well, I don't know if they were really saved in the first place. Shame on us. Paul not only led Titus to the Lord, but he involved him. He took him with him. He encouraged him in the faith. And don't you know what a blessing it would have been to that young man to travel with Paul and Barnabas? Well, they went to Jerusalem and they were led by the Holy Spirit of God. And they shared how God was ministering through Paul because there was so much at stake. Was it going to be by law or by grace that someone was saved? Was it going to be human attainment or was it going to be divine atonement? Was a man saved by grace and then plus works? Or was Christ's blood alone a sufficient sacrifice for sin? So you see, they, they, they didn't just go on vacation. They didn't just take a few days off. This was in defense of the gospel of grace. Now notice defending the gospel. Paul says, but neither Titus, who was with me being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. You see, here the legalist wanted to add something to salvation by grace. They wanted to add a rite, a ritual, something to tack on, and a, an addendment. You would have think they would have been in Congress, wouldn't you? <laughs> Trying to pass a bill and add something else to it. They would have made great congressmen today. Well, all the legalists haven't died, haven't vanished off the face of the earth. There are still those who try to add the work of a man to the grace of Christ, the grace of the Lord Jesus. Here it was circumcision. There it's something else or something else. And Paul resisted, he rejected, he refused the demands of the legalists. He would not surrender God-given convictions. It was a hill that he was willing to die on. It was something that he would not, nor he could not, compromise. Today, we talk about the fundamentals of the faith. In other words, things that we cannot retreat from. Things that we cannot compromise. And I think if I ever do, I pray God will strike me down and get me out of the way. But I'll never compromise the inerrant, verbally inspired word of God. This is his book, not our book. It's his, written to us. It's a love letter written to us and without error. You know, if scientists, we, we were talking the other day, if they'd read that verse, you'd save them a lot of time to study. Years ago, they said... Guess what? The earth is round. Well, let me see if they'd have read the Bible and it said the angels sat on the circle of the earth. Maybe it would have saved a lot of time. <laughs> a few government grants or whatever. But we cannot compromise the word of God. We can add to it. And bless God, we better not take anything from it. <coughs> and then we can't take away from, in the beginning, God. That God created the heavens and the earth. It wasn't a big bang. That's going to come with those who don't believe that. It, no. Uh, it, it's like taking a typewriter and throwing it up in the air. And when it hits the ground and everything, he said, my goodness, look, there's the alphabet just laid out there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I won't accept any doctrine that takes away from the virgin birth of Christ, his sinless life, his vicarious death in my place, his precious blood playing, paying for my sin, my salvation, his death, his burial, his bodily resurrection, his return for his bride, 
His prepared place for believers in heaven. I cannot. And I will not. It's a line in the sand from which we can never surrender or retreat. And this is where Paul found himself. Paul stood firm in the faith. And he had the approval and the support of all the apostles. United in Christ and united in grace. You know, if you stay in the Bible long enough, you're going to offend some folks. <laughs> you know, I think the word is there to comfort the afflicted, but it also afflicts the comfortable. <laughs> and we've got to tell it like the Lord tells us to preach it as it is to men and women and boys and girls like they are. And they were united in Christ and in his grace. But notice something else. They had a profession without having a possession. In verse 4, Paul says, And that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Paul says, Beware of false brethren. You ever read the account of the wheat and the tares? You know, it, it doesn't speak about wheat and sunflowers. <laughs> wheat and tares. You know, I can spot a sunflower. <laughs> I can look in that, that puppy. If you don't deal with it, it'll grow up. And you can climb up in it and make a deer blind out of it. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't look like coastal. It doesn't look like medio. It doesn't look like any grass. It's entirely different, and you can spot it, and, and, and I can tell what it is. They just look different. My stepmother raised some of the... Well, let me back up. I live on my grandfather's old farm that we inherited, 1901. That's like a whole bunch of years ago. And uh, my stepmother in San Antonio raised these big old sunflowers for the seeds. You, you know, just big heads on them. And my old German grandfather, Opa, came to visit us one time, and he helped my dad out. He found a hoe, and he cut them all down. <laughs> and she was crying, and I, I have to be honest with you, I thought it was kind of funny. Uh, because he had fought them suckers all his life. They were the enemy. And he didn't give a rip if their head was that big or if it was this big. They were coming down. <laughs> he attacked them with a vengeance. Well, but tares look like wheat. The Bible says in Matthew, the 13th chapter, beginning with verse 24, Jesus is speaking. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the household came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? But Whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, You want us to go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I'll say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. The Lord took care of the matter of the wheat and the tares. God's going to ultimately take care of them. Well, these false brethren were like tares. They looked like believers. They spoke like they were believers. But they were professing without actually 
possessing the Lord. They were destitute of any spiritual life. And they had crept into the body for the purpose of enslaving by their rights and their rules and their regulations. They came in and they infiltrated just to be able to examine carefully because they had a hostile intent to bring into bondage, to undermine our liberty in Christ. And the scripture says, beware. Beware of false brethren. Who have a profession, but don't have a possession of the gospel of grace. Now the truth of the gospel. In verse 5, it says, to whom, Paul speaking, he says, to whom we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour. That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Paul did not yield. He stood firm. He didn't give an inch. What he's saying is dealing with people like this is like dealing with the devil. In other words, when the devil's in your face and you take a step back, it does not mean that you have created some space. You take a step back, and let me tell you something, he takes a step forward. And the more you retreat, the more aggressive he becomes. The Bible says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But if you turn and run, he will tear you up. That's the Eichel's translation if you (laughs) need to get that. In Matthew 23, 4, Jesus said that these who were legalists, these who were Judaizers, put more on an individual than what they could bear. You ever heard about the straw that broke the camel's back? Who wants to see a camel with a broken back? Who wants to keep stacking on and stacking on and stacking on until the camel can't move until ultimately that the camel goes down? Jesus said, these are just like that. When they take away from the gospel of grace and they add to it in a variety of ways, They're just like these. Nothing, nothing has changed. Well, here's the litmus test, the critical factor. Hold everything up in the light of the gospel. You cannot live by bread alone, but you can live by every word of God. It's not what we feel about something. A lot of people say, well, preacher, I don't care. I, this is what I feel. You know, it doesn't matter what we feel. What matters is what the Word of God says. I, can you imagine me telling an officer who would have pulled, Joan off to the, uh, pulled me over <laughs> to the side of the road? Well, sir, I just didn't feel like that was fast enough. He didn't care what I feel. Just keeps writing, you know. Well, sometimes our feelings fail us, don't they? Sometimes people appear to be happy on the outside and you find out they're really hurting on the inside. They're really crying on the inside. But yet we just observe the outward. And there's other times people are just, whoa. But they're so happy. They're so overwhelmed by the goodness and the grace of God that they can't help but shed a tear. So, the scripture says about the Lord in Psalms 93, 5, thy testimonies are very sure that you can count on the word of God no matter what your circumstances are. Well, notice God's call to preach the gospel. Verse 6, but of these who seem to be somewhat, whoever they were, it makes no matter to me, God accepts no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of 
uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. <clears throat> Paul was not called by man. He was called by God. We used to say uh, somebody was mama called and daddy sent. <laughs> that means that they weren't much. Mama said, son, I think you ought to be a preacher. They don't have to work but one day a week. <laughs> An hour. And then daddy sent them. Mama called and daddy sent. He paid the bill for them to go. Paul says this wasn't true with him because God looks on the heart and he's no respecter of persons. God's not impressed with a man's office or his position. When Joan and I were married, we were very young. And I want to get away from the pulpit when I say this, but I was so young that they had to put a board on the barber chair so I could sit up high enough for them <laughs> to cut my hair. Mm. But seriously, I was 18 or 19 years old and a chair opened up. And I headed for it and an officer stepped ahead of me and he said, what rank are you, son? I said, it doesn't matter what rank I am, what matters is I'm next. <laughs> and I climbed in the chair. I thank God he was not my commanding officer. <laughs> or I learned something about rank. But God doesn't care about your rank. He cares about your relationship to him. Because if you don't have a relationship with him, then you are rank. Notice what he says, when they saw. In other words, the proof is in the pudding is, is what they say. You know, they saw fruit. And when I thought about that, maybe the world hasn't rejected the gospel of grace. They just haven't seen it in my life. Maybe they haven't seen it in your life. And we talk to them about everything else but the gospel of grace. And how they can be saved by grace through faith plus nothing. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Even the faith to believe is a gift from holy God. When they saw. There's only one gospel. There wasn't any difference in content. There was just a difference in the recipients. Peter was sent to the circumcised, to the religious Jewish people of that day. Paul was sent to the Gentiles, to the uncircumcised of that day. And I get, I get excited, I get caught up in that because here is Paul, one of the most educated people in that day. And he had sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He had a degree or degrees like a thermometer. He was somebody. And God said, come here, boy. I'm going to send you to the dumbest people in Guadalupe County. No, he didn't say that. But he said, I'm going to send you to the barbarians. I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. Well, Lord, what about my training? And here's old Peter. He's a, oh, 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 I'm a big old fisherman. And the Lord says to him, he said, I'm going to send you to all these wealthy, educated guys. You're going to talk to them about me. <laughs> me? Talk to them. Isn't that something? God can do what he wants to do. Amen. And if we don't do what he said, the rocks can cry out. He doesn't need us. We need him. Desperately. Well, one gospel. Wednesday night before church, a man got to hear the gospel of grace in his native language. 
and he prayed to receive Christ. Paul says, well, it was that gospel which was committed unto me and trusted to me, a certain commission. I have never been sent to a metropolitan city to preach the gospel. And let me tell you something, they are all very thankful. But uh, Dr. W.A. Criswell was such a hero of the faith. And Dr. Criswell labored a long, long time at First Baptist Church, Dallas. And he would stand and he would talk about his ministry and his mission there in Dallas. And he would say with that booming voice, I would rather serve God on top of a flagpole in downtown Dallas than in the largest ranch in South Texas. They asked me to preach at Criswell College one year. And I quoted Dr. Criswell. And I said, I thank God because that's one more guy that's not moving to South Texas. <laughs> God used him there mightily. And God uses different people in different places. When they saw what was committed unto me and trusted to me is what Paul is saying. When they saw it, there was a joint participation in the gospel. In verse 8 and 9, For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James and Peter and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and to Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go into the heathen and they should go to the circumcision. What a blessing. Paul and Peter were not in competition. Paul said before, he said, what are you doing saying I am of Paul, I am of Peter, I am of Apollos? Is Christ divided? No, he's one. Praise the Lord for people being saved someplace beyond our four walls. Thank the Lord for it. We're not in competition. Each one of them was divinely appointed with a divine message to be delivered with divine power. And Paul more or less had a, had a preaching ministry, but let me tell you some old, old coarse, ignorant Peter over here, uh, he, he preached one message. And thousands were saved. God can do what he wants to do. And they, were, they weren't in competition. If, I hate to use the term, if the Lord tarries, if the Lord doesn't come, by September next year, Franklin Graham is going to be in San Antonio. And evangelical churches all across the area will join together to try to reach this area for the Lord Jesus Christ. Not in competition, but to see people come to a saving knowledge of Christ. When Paul talked with James and Peter and John, who seemed to be pillars in the church, and they perceived the grace given to us by God, they gave us the right hand of fellowship. What does that mean? Well, surely means fellowship. There's a difference between friendship and fellowship. You know that? I've got friends that are not believers. We can talk about tractors. We can talk about horses. We can talk about cattle. We can talk about land. We can talk about a lot of things. And we are friends. But if I start talking about Jesus, we don't... It's a, it's a, it's a no-gainer, no-brainer. It's a, a non-issue. They don't want to do it. We have friendship, but we don't have fellowship. One of the guys I went to school with told one of the secretaries, said, boy, I'd like to see old Butch again, but I don't want him to talk to me about Jesus. He considered us friends, that we had friendship, but we didn't have fellowship. 
Paul said they extended to us the right hand of fellowship. In other words, they accepted who we were in Christ Jesus. And we had this unity. We had this common bond. And they also, it meant cooperation. We're going to work together to win our world to the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a joint participation here. And you know the exciting thing? The legalists were pushed aside and five of these guys shook hands and went on to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in a powerful way. Because none of that made a difference. They were bonded together in love and in the power of the gospel to reach their world for Christ. I believe they went charging the gates of hell with a water pistol. Boldness. Praying for it. You know, things haven't changed. That's what we need to do. The early church prayed for boldness. It, it, it wasn't, does anybody here have a prayer request? And I hope, God forgive, if you have an Aunt Frony. But would you pray for my Aunt Frony? She had an ingrown toenail one time, and I'm, I'm hoping she's getting better. No, they prayed for boldness. Lord, give us the courage. Give us the strength. Give us the burden. Give us the, the passion, the zeal to talk to people about Christ. That's, that's how they prayed. But the psalmist says, 133, 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is a good thing. And then there's the proof of the gospel's impact in verse 7. Or in verse 10. Somewhere. <laughs> Only they would that we should remember the poor. The same which I also was forward to do. We are so blessed in the United States. We talk about all the negative. But the positive thing, we are blessed. You take our, the poorest of our poor here are the richest of the rich in a lot of places in the world. Did you know that? I was in Umahaya, Nigeria, a city of over 200,000. And they wanted to make sure that I was treated royalty, royally. And so I stayed in the home of a husband and wife. He was the leading attorney, the most popular attorney in a city of over 200,000. I'd be staying with Mike the Hammer now or whoever he is. <laughs> So the lead attorney in the city and his wife was a civil court judge. That's where they rated economically there. I stayed in their apartment. The rooms didn't have doors dividing from one to the other. They just had a curtain. They had a commode but it didn't have water hooked up to it. You had to pour in water from a five gallon bucket. There was no shower. There was a bar of soap and water that they had gotten in that five gallon bucket. In the whole church, there was one car and that was their car. And it was a 12 year old Volvo I don't know how many thousands of miles it had on it. This was the wealthiest couple there. And let me tell you something. We don't have a housing project in San Antonio that's not better than that. Remember the poor is what he said. And Paul said, we are. And I thank the Lord that we have a benevolence ministry and we have this addict benevolence ministry. And I'm thankful to pastor a people 
that will build a whole facility of about $250,000 to be able to give food and clothing and assistance and the gospel of grace to the poor. Remember the poor. When we're faithful to the least, the last, and the lost, God is faithful to us. Amen. And we need to remember. So, Paul is saying in very simple terms, it's either Jesus' way or no way. Jesus said, I am the way, not a way. I am the way. And we really need to cry aloud because there's a lot of uncertain sounds out there. There's a lot of people that say it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. You have to believe that God's the meanest person in the universe if you ascribe to that kind of doctrine because he let Jesus die for nothing. If there was another way, just be good. Just live right. Just do good things. But because we can't do it on our own. God did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He gave his only begotten son. Jesus did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He paid the price. He was not only our great high priest, he was the sacrifice. It was his blood that he took into the presence of the Father to pay for my sins and to for your sins. This gospel of grace It's a wonderful thing today to be able to say biblically, whosoever will may come. Whosoever will may come. You coming is an act of your will. It's not me on display. It's not me being able to petition you. It's a fact that you come to the realization I'm lost and Jesus is the solution. And by an act of the will, I'm going to come and give my heart and life to Christ. If you're not saved, well, I don't understand that term saved, and I don't know what it is to be born again. Let me ask you, if you were to die today, do you know without a shadow of a doubt that you'd be with the Lord Jesus Christ? You need to check your ticket to see whether it's been punched. Because when you're saved, our salvation is not based on us being able to hold on to him, it's him being able to hold on to us. And I'm saved by the gospel of grace. And if you are saved, or if you want to be saved, we'll meet you at the front and pray with you. And you ought to, not for salvation, but you ought to have a desire to be identified with him, to show the world, I really believe that he died for me. I really believe that he was buried. He didn't swoon in the tomb. He was buried. He was dead and buried. But praise God, the grave couldn't hold him. He arose victorious. I'm dead to myself, but I'm raised to walk in this new life he's given me. You ought to show the world that. And if you're saved and identified and God is leading you here, we want you to know that you're welcome. You come, we'll meet you at the front. Let's stand and pray today. Father, we do thank you for your word. Father, how you take the word and deal with us and so simply explain to us the gospel of grace and the importance, the necessity of us coming to you by faith. And Lord, we know that the wicked one right now is dealing with people's hearts and lives. Saying, you don't need to do it now. You don't need to do it today. You don't need to do it here. But if not now, then when? And if not here, where? God has given you this day, this hour, to make that decision for him. To be saved, to
to come as a saved person desiring to be identified with him, to come to plant your life in the life of his church, and Satan will do everything he can to reign on your parade. Father, give people the courage, the strength to step out, to let go, and to let you have your way. In Jesus' name, amen.